Now we're counting down to the third plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee. That's starting this coming weekend. A key part of those meetings will be plans for financial reforms. Now while optimism from investors has pushed up related stock prices to feverish highs, Chung Lei shows us why the hype shouldn't be part of those expectations. Expecting big surprises from the financial reform plans? You might be let down. Huang Yiping, professor at Peking University's China Center for Economic Research, which is tasked with research to back up the reform plans, says by their nature, the plans won't be radical. It will have to be um, reassessed by so many officials during the process, and everybody ha has his or her own viewpoint, and these are all reflected in the final product. So I think the final product will be a relatively well-rounded document. Of the tough nuts left to crack, it's interest rates that may move first. Savings rate normalization, uh, mainly the interest rate deregulation, uh, we should expect something to happen probably within the next 12 months. In contrast, opening up on the capital account, which means Chinese people will be able to invest overseas freely, may need to come later. I think the hardest the, or the most dangerous ones would be the opening up the capital market, capital accounts and uh, to make the exchange rate uh, to be uh, flexible. And those, would, I think they, they are harder to, to, to do because in order to get there, your financial institutions need to be competitive. But reform is already in the air and the entrepreneurs who are among Chen's students at the business school are feeling it. I think in the first half of the year, uh, it was much more pessimistic, uh, a lot of rumors. But uh, up to now, I think uh, it is changing much more positive and, uh, and related because there were a lot of reforms taking place, including the Shanghai Free Trade Zone. Here on Beijing's Financial Street, it takes me just minutes to walk from the securities regulators to the banking regulators. But these top regulatory bodies have very different functions and interests. That's why pushing for coordinated reform can be quite a challenge. Well, China government is a very big administration, so uh, I do see the different functions uh, when they make these uh, reform steps. Um, you know, they may not have calculated every step very carefully, especially cal calculating the other administration's uh, steps very carefully. So these sort of bumps do happen. What Jerry is most upbeat about is the de-risking that's going on in the financial system and believes it will eventually translate into higher stocks. So I think the, you know, the, the market will gradually adapt uh, to this new form of deleveraging, de-risking. And I think this will give us a path to sustainability. And I think at one point, I don't know what exactly the timing will be, maybe in year 20, late 2014, maybe in 2015, we will have a bull market. The financial reforms package from the third plenum meetings may not shock and awe, but those who are bullish on China's reforms recognize they're not an end in itself, but a 35-year process that's going to go much further in the next decade. Cheng Lei, CCTV News. So what can we expect in terms of financial reforms that may be rolled out at the upcoming plenary session? Lily is here with the details. Lily, what might be on the agenda? Expectation is pretty high, but as Lei just mentioned in her report, uh, the outcome may not be shocking at all, but it still marks a very important step forward. Mm. Let's get the details here. Uh, this is all according to a China Securities Journal article, which was published uh, speculating on the possible moves regarding this reform. While the top priority is to push for a more market-based interest rate system, the move is aimed at establishing an interest rate system completely determined by supply and demand, and also uh, to provide promote, uh, let's say, um, the survival of the fittest principle within the financial sector. And second, reforming uh, the uh, foreign exchange system to form an easily convertible RMB capital account and a clearer system for domestic investors to invest in foreign countries. Also, reforms will reduce the government's equity in financial institutions and also encourage more acquisitions and also reorganizations. And regarding this, an expert from the China Academy of Social Sciences says that positive impacts from the reforms will be quite limited 
without establishing a separate entity to direct the country's monetary policy. Now, this will also add importance to the role that market plays in the whole economy. Back to you, Mike. All right, so certainly a lot to a look at. A lot to expect. To watch out but I for. think that analyst actually meant to manage the uh, expectations there. All right, manage your expectations, but a lot Indeed, to watch out for yeah. as well. Many thanks for that, Rondell Lilly. So let's dive into which big financial reforms in China you need to watch out for at the upcoming plenary session. Einar Tangen, our current affairs commentator, joins us right here in Beijing, as well as Daniel Gross, director at the Center for European Policy Studies, who joins us from Brussels. Gentlemen, many thanks for joining us tonight. So, Einar, let's start with you. Uh, when we talk about financial reforms here in China, there are many that the country needs to undertake, right? Rate reforms, banking reforms, capital market reforms, etc. But the overall goal of these reforms is to sort of better allow finance and the markets to serve China's real economy. Which financial reforms should we be looking out for at the plenary session that will best accomplish that goal, you think? I, I think the, the overall emphasis is going to be on SMEs, small and medium-sized business entities. This is where the, uh, the next great wave for, of China opportunity is, just similar to what happened during the land reforms of, uh, under, um, excuse me, under the uh, reform period under Deng Xiaoping. There was uh, tremendous uh, creativity and productivity that was unleashed when they separated these things and allowed people to be very innovative and creative in their approach to the market. All right. So here at home, we want to strengthen the link between finance and the real economy. Einar mentioned uh, small and medium-sized enterprise. They account for about 60 percent of the country's jobs and the economy as well right now. Danny, I want to go to you now. What does more financial openness here in China mean for business and investors where you are in Europe? Now, the EU, after all, is China's largest trading partner. Yes, and the EU is also uh, a region where there's lots of uh, finance which wants to be invested somewhere else. There are many German savers, for example, who no longer trust uh, Italy or Spain. They're also a bit leery of the United States, so they think, if I really could invest in China, that would be a great opportunity. And then there are the European banks. They would, of course, love to have the business of exchanging the RMB and making uh, the transactions for European firms exporting to China and vice versa. All these groups are looking with great uh, interest at what's going on. Hmm. And we'll talk about the uh, RMB in just a few moments. Uh, Einar, back to you. It's agreed, right, that financial reforms are necessary here in China. But with more financial deregulation and openness, of course, comes more volatility and risks. Uh, is China's financial regulatory structure ready for big bang financial reforms? And if not, what more needs to be done to strengthen the regulatory scheme? Well, I, th I think the com uh, country's on a path. I, I don't necessarily agree that you need a, a monetary uh, policy maker. I think the Bank of China has done that role and done it successfully in guiding, uh, guiding the country. In terms of reform, it's about willpower. Does the current government have the willpower to uh, put officials on notice that they have to implement these forms if they want to rise? I think that will make the big difference. All right. Now, when we think about reforms, uh, we often think it's a very domestic-oriented event. Daniel, how might Europe, or the West in general, uh, assist China in further opening up its financial markets and reach its reform goals since the global financial markets are so interconnected these days? Well, I think fundamentally these are choices for China. They're very difficult ones, and perhaps the only thing uh, Europe uh, can show is how not to do it, what mistakes to avoid, to open too quickly, uh, to open uh, too fast when the domestic financial system doesn't work. The one lesson uh, we have made here in Europe is, uh, if you take the example of Germany, if your own currency becomes an international reserve currency, that's actually not so good for the country concerned because then you lose control over your exchange rate, you lose part of your control over domestic economic policy levers. Mm. So beware of doing it too quickly and beware of creating a new international currency. Right, so reforms need to happen at a more gradual pace. Uh, gentlemen, do stay with us. More questions for you in just a few moments. Meanwhile, we also had a detailed conversation with Huang Yiping. He's a professor at Peking University's China Center for Economic Research. Our Cheng Lei started by asking why financial liberalization remains a priority on the government's to-do list. Have a listen. We did a good job in expanding quantitative scales of financial activities, but we were relatively weak in liberalizing the market. Interest rate, exchange rates still somewhat regulated by the government, and we're still short in terms of um, improving governance structure of state-owned financial institutions. So um, you look at the financial sector, it's already quite huge. 
but uh, structurally I think we still have a significant gap and that's something we need to do now and this is why financial liberalization now is probably on the top of the agenda. Normally I think people look at the four things when you talk about the financial liberalization, interest rate liberalization, um, exchange rate policy reform, improvement in the state-owned financial institutions, governance structure and the capital account convertibility. At least I would say interest rate liberalization is already on the way. China frees up savings rates. Mm. What's that going to do to the economy? The first thing it will do is to increase household income. The, profit, the, the interest rate margins will be narrowed. So it will be a big squeeze on the corporate sector, on the banking sector. Activities may slow. But rising um, interest rate may not be necessarily be a bad thing because actually it makes people more careful when they make investment decisions and hopefully will improve efficiency. Um, but we also need to be careful about the financial risks. Do you think this is going to happen in the Shanghai Free Trade Zone and is it really going to be successfully um, rolled out to the rest of the country anytime soon? Interest rate liberalization really need a broad market to experiment. If you have an area of 28 km square kilometers with 10 banks and 10 companies, do you really believe you're going to formulate market interest rate in that zone even so without even without the um, reference of a risk-free yield curve. How do we know what is the market? Um, so I think these probably need to be done in a more broad area. When it comes to financial regulation, we now have technological innovations such as mm. uh, internet finance. And you've been receiving all these invitations mm. to go to all sorts right. of seminars mm. about this very, very hot mm. area. Mm. Um, what sort of regulation and supervision can we expect? I, yeah, I, I went to lunch yesterday with my students um, and uh, they surprised me that everybody has an, a phone, um, uh, has an account on their phone. After the lunch, they just pay each other by hooking their phones together without going to the banks and without taking out any cash. But we also have one particular reason why internet finance is becoming extremely attractive because of the monopoly in the financial industry. And uh, so internet finance really helps to bypass all the monopolies and the transactions can be done on our mobile phones and so on without even the banks knowing it. Now Biz Asia's Guan Xin also spoke with Fred Hu on China's ongoing financial transformation. Fred Hu is the chairman and founder of Primavera Capital and was formerly Greater China Chairman of Goldman Sachs. Here's what he had to say. Dr. Hu, thank you for joining us. The third plenary session of the CPC is around the corner. What is your expectation of the agenda of financial reform? Uh, there are many initiatives that have been uh, discussed, and I expect the third plenary will uh, you know, map out uh, a strategy, such as uh, areas of interest rate deregulation, uh, the gradual opening up of the capital account mm -hmm. and to reduce entry barriers for private capital into financial service mm -hmm. uh, industry mm -hmm. so as to create more competition. But talking about the deregulation of the interest rates, although the government has introduced a more market-based lending rate, but a more meaningful saving rate reform is still held back due to the challenges. How do you see the pace of the, these reforms? I'm in favor of speeding up uh, reforms uh, because China has all the conditions uh, in place to accelerate uh, necessary reforms. I think the risk of uh, the risk facing China is uh, not too fast but uh, you know, too slow uh, that will you know, squander uh, important opportunities and uh, not serve China's interest uh, well. So I'm really hopeful for this third plenary is going to provide a significant political impetus uh, to the reform process so the country can move uh, forward uh, much more quickly. Well, China is gradually opening up its capital accounts, and some are betting that the Chinese renminbi will continue to appreciate next year. 
Do you think a stronger yuan will be a good or bad thing for China's economy? As long as Chinese economy continues to grow at a moderately rapid pace, and this continued improvement in productivity, underlying productivity in our economy, uh, so an appreciating currency, uh, you know, is n is not a bad thing. It's not unlike is unlikely to uh, hurt our uh, competitiveness. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, over a long time, a strong currency is a reflection of the fundamental, the strength of the economic fundamentals. In the short term, there's a lot of noise, like a lot of volatility, but over a long time, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the strength of currency uh, does. Uh, to a much greater degree, reflect the strength of the economic fundamentals. So, you know, if China continues to push ahead, push forward reforms, and China's economy continues to perform uh, very strongly, so I expect yes, the currency will further uh, strengthen. You know, again, not that uh, dramatically in the short term, but uh, over time uh, into into the future. Uh, so then, more and more investors institutions, companies, and even uh, central banks ar around the world want to hold more and more uh, RMB because it's a very strong currency. So then there's a realistic chance RMB might become uh, a leading global reserve currency. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to hold you know, as part of significant part of their uh, reserves. Thank you for sharing with us. So Thank when you. we talk about financial reforms here in China, the topic of exchange rate reforms and RMB internationalization inevitably joins the discussion as well. Uh, let's bring back Einar and Daniel to get their take on the issue. Uh, Einar, so rate reforms and capital account liberalization needs to happen before free currency can occur. Uh, the two reforms I just mentioned needs to be a gradual process. Therefore, while China is in this transitional period, are there other major moves that can be done to boost the RMB's global presence? Well, I don't, I don't think it, it, it's a natural occurring event. The fact is that China is the greatest trading nation now, uh, going back and forth from many, many nations, and it's a natural occurrence. I mean, it took only 10 years for the uh, U.S. dollar to surpass uh, British sterling um, uh, after World War II, and that could quite rapidly happen here as well. Mm. All right, and Daniel, before China's uh, financial markets are fully matured or at a point close to maturity, is it really wise to make cross-border RMB flows freer? Look at what happened during the Asian financial crisis. China certainly doesn't want to be a victim in something like that. Well, we have made also more recently in Europe the experience that open financial markets uh, can create havoc if they're not properly regulated and if there are booms and busts uh, which develop. So I would say capital account uh, liberalization and totally free convertibility of the RMB should really be the last priority of the Chinese government. The first one should be to make the financial system more efficient mm. so that investment in capital in China, within China, is much better allocated. All the rest, I think, is secondary. All right, so you're saying sequencing matters in RMB liberalization and RMB free convertibility should be the last step in the process. Now, Einar, how might a freely convertible RMB impact global trade and finance? Lots of talk right now about currency replacing uh, certain reserve currencies. The yuan uh, is what I'm talking about. Uh, what's your vision for the Chinese yuan, the RMB, five to ten years down the road uh, as it evolves from a regional to a more global currency? Well, I, I think a lot of the answers have been given by Mr. Goss. Uh, I think he's absolutely right, and he's been very considerate. Uh, we've also, in the U.S., had some uh, real difficulties here uh, with it. So I think China has to take a measured approach to its things, and I agree that the last thing you should be doing is looking to make your, res uh, your currency reserve currency. The national prestige can be quite outdone by the, let us say, the uh, side effects of this. Mm. Over. Over the long run, it's the strength of the Chinese market and your massive, massive consumer uh, markets that are growing now that are going to be the key indicators. Uh, looking at the, at the smaller picture, the trade inflows and the people who are speculating that the yuan will continue to rise, these are aberrations, and you have to look past these towards the natural strength. And I think the Chinese government is going to take steps to make sure these hot money flows uh, remain at a minimum. All right, and finally tonight, uh, Daniel, we're seeing London, of course, making a major push to become the offshore RMB leader and hub in Europe. Paris also vying for the spot. Uh, currency swaps between the PBOC and European national central banks uh, are being signed. How is the growing presence of the RMB felt in Europe? 
There are, of course, all the financial uh, centers in Europe uh, who would like, which would like to have a part of the action. But the only serious ones are really Frankfurt, where there's the European Central Bank, and London, which is, of course, of course a global financial center. But I think given that we are uh, integrating within the Eurozone, that we might have soon a common banking regulator in Frankfurt, uh, common banker solution fund, and so on, I would say that maybe this time most of the action will congregate where the monetary policy is being done in Europe, and that's in Frankfurt. All right. But London, of course, will also keep its share of the global trade. Okay, some great insights tonight, gentlemen. Daniel Gross, Einar Tangen, joining us on the discussion about RMB convertibility as well as financial reforms.